The topic of this video is building linear models from data. This is a continuation of the previous video. Okay, so you notice that I made some changes here. Um, I've cleared away the work that we wrote in finding that this was a linear function. I also cleared away the table of values uh, because they're here represented on our ordered pairs for our graph. This will clear up some space so that we can continue on with the rest of this problem. And here we go, part C. Determine the linear function that describes the relationship between x and n. Well, we proved in part B that all of these dots here form a straight line. So if somebody asks you to determine the linear function, what they're asking for is an equation of the line that goes through all of those dots. And that's pretty easy to find. Just pick two of these four points and use the point-slope formula to write the equation of the line. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing you want to do is pick two points. So let's say we did these two right here because the numbers are the smallest. To write the equation of a line, you need to know two things. You need to know the slope of the line, and you need to know a point on the line. Well, good news. In part B, we already found the slope of the line that goes through these two points. And we found that that slope was equal to 90.625. So in order to write the equation of our line, now we just need to pick one of the points on our line. And again, we'll pick the one with the smallest numbers. So the point we're going to use is going to be 16, 1450. Okay, we're now ready to write the equation of our line. We have a point and a slope. The point is not an intercept. So that means that we don't have a slope and an intercept. We just have a point and a slope. So we're going to use the point-slope formula. The point-slope formula says y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. All right, so now we can go ahead and plug into our formula. Uh, anywhere we see x1, y1, or m, we're going to put a number. All right, so y1 is the y-coordinate of our point. That's 1450. M is this 90.625 value. I needed to leave a little bit more room for that. 90.625. And X1 is the X coordinate of our point, which is 16. All right, now we're going to distribute this here. So we get Y minus 1450 equals 90.625X minus 1450. And we add 1450 on both sides. And we get the final result, y equals 90.625x. Now there's only one tiny change that I would want to make to this equation uh, before I call this my final answer. Remember that our variables in this problem are not x and y, they are x and n. So really, everywhere I wrote a y all throughout my solution method here, I really should have been writing an n, because this is telling me what n equals. And the last thing I'd say before we move on to part D is, what does this mean and how is this useful to us? Well, what this is saying is if n represents the number of songs and x represents the size of the music player measured in gigabytes, just take the gigabyte size, multiply it by 90.625, and that'll tell you how many songs that it can hold. So for example, if x is equal to 16, then you just have to do 16 times 90.625 and it will give you 1,450. A 16 gigabyte uh, music player can hold, can, uh, hold 1,450 songs. So now I have an equation that allows me to predict the future. I'm no longer limited to just these four data points. I can pick any size music player and determine how many songs it will be able to hold. All right, so that was part C. Part D, what is the implied domain of the linear function? Well, when it comes to domain, we know we're talking about x, and we know that in the world that there's uh, the possibility for a number of gigabytes other than just 16 or 32 or 64 or 128. In fact, you could have literally any real number of gigabytes uh, as long as that number is zero or larger. Uh, it's possible to have no memory. If you take your MP3 player or your digital music player and you remove the memory chip, then there's going to be no memory in it. So zero is the smallest possible value, and then that just goes right on up towards infinity. So the domain is going to be from zero to infinity. Bracket zero comma infinity. All right, that brings us to part E. Graph the linear function in the Cartesian plane drawn in part A. 
So that's actually very easy to do. We know it's linear. We've already got the dots. We just have to connect them. So we're going to connect the dots. So get out your straight edge. Remember that lines, line segments, and rays must be drawn with a straight edge. Uh, you might notice that I'm drawing the, the line not only through those points, but also through the origin. Uh, there is a reason why I am doing that, and I will share that reason with you just as soon as I finish drawing the line. Think about the equation for the line that we uh, wrote just a moment ago. Uh, we wrote that n was equal to 90.625x. And there was no number after this. There was no plus something or subtract something. What that means is, is that the y-intercept is zero. And therefore, our line must go through the origin. And you can see that by drawing a straight line through the dots that we plotted, it does indeed go through the origin. All right, and then finally, interpret the slope. So interpreting slope is very easy. You just have to remember that slope is rise over run. So let's go ahead and do that. So slope is rise over run. Rise is a change in the y variable. Run is a change in the x variable. Of course, in this particular problem, there is no y. There's just n. So I'm going to erase that y. I'm going to put an n there in its place. So change in n, which is the number of songs divided by the change in x, which is the number of gigabytes. And we know that the slope, which is a value that we computed previously, is this number 90.625. So I kind of ran out of room here. I would like very much to be able to write equals 90.625. Uh, I guess this is the last part of the problem, so I'll just go ahead and erase the graph here. We've already done everything we need to do with that graph. Okay, so this equals 90.625. Now I'm going to write that as a fraction. Uh, to turn something that is not a fraction into a fraction, you just put a 1 under it. And now we're going to do a very, very easy word comparison here. We're going to put this number and this number together. And we're going to put this number and this idea together and then make a sentence. Remember, this is all about change. So when the number of gigabytes changes by one, then the number of songs changes by 90.625. Let's write that. When the number of gigabytes changes by one, the number of songs changes by 90.625. All right, so from this we learn a very interesting relationship for this particular type of digital music player. Uh, one gigabyte can hold 90.625, two gigabytes can hold that number divided uh, multiplied by two, and so on and so on and so on. And with that we can predict the number of songs that can be held by any type of digital music player.